Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the manifold gifts of the Holy Spirit, beginning with the ability to have a true faith and understanding in the mysteries of the supernatural revelation of God in Jesus Christ, which leads us to the, the gift of love as well, to be able to love as God loves, love God first and love each other, and to know the love of God. Lord God, make those uh, solid in us, first and foremost, so that all the other gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit can be evident in our life, just in the way that we need them to serve you well. And I ask that today, Lord, in our study, somehow or another, it uh, enriches and enables that process in our lives to bring us closer to you, to worship you more properly, to appreciate you more genuinely, to love you more purely. In Christ's name I pray, amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. So first of all, I begin with an apology. I made an uh, error last week, which is one that I make quite often. It's a tactical, strategic error. I knew there was too much material when we, when we did the Eucharist for one session. That much was right. I erroneously thought we could cover it in two. <laughs> And that's the reason I was going so fast last week. And I apologize because afterwards I had some people tell me, he said, well, you know, I, I, there were some comments I wanted to make and you didn't get to me and I, I'm sorry for that. That's not the way we, we should operate. So we're going to do three sessions on the Eucharist, okay? Ron? I couldn't be here last week. Could you start over? Uh-huh. <laughs> make it four. No, but I have good news for you. Okay. It's, it'll be online. Right, so. We covered a lot of material last week. I told you way back when we began this study that of all the reasons in my own heart and mind it's wonderful to be Catholic, the best reason is the sacraments to me. This very reliable, wonderful inexhaustible source of God's goodness and grace that we need, we absolutely must have, to live the abundant life he says he wants us to have. And of those sacraments, the Eucharist is uh, at the top of the list, I think, uh, for me. Because on a practical day-to-day, -day, continually, you know, knocking my socks off kind of experience, the Eucharist is the one that we receive the most. And so I think it's right that we give it a little bit more time. We won't exhaust the topic even in three sessions, but I hope at least we can uh, put some practically good and deep roots into it, okay? To just briefly recap, <laughs> Ron, what I, what I said I thought I wanted to do was to talk about the Eucharist in the Old Testament. I just alluded to it, really. We ripped through it. Because it's prophetically there. I did, and the point was, I didn't want anybody to think that the Eucharist began at the Last Supper. It's like God tried all these other things, now we're going to do this. But I got a new idea. <laughs> it's, it was part and parcel of the new covenant reality, the brilliance, the culmination of salvation history that he had started from the very beginning. And we just pointed at a, a few of those streams of, of anticipatory, prophetic uh, message in the Old Testament, some of which was in the animal sacrifices, some of it which was in the uh, covenant communion meal, some of it was in the sacrifices of individuals, Abraham and Isaac, or uh, Abel, way back, you know, in Genesis. We talked about Melchizedek and the Todah, or the Thanksgiving offering. We talked about the Passover meal. All of these and others are all part of the picture that was coming together and which at the Last Supper, you know, became in reality what had been anticipated in hope. So, uh, but even at, and then we spent some time talking about that Last Supper, but it was set up not at the Last Supper, even in Jesus' time. I thought it was very important for us to understand it was basically the answer to a question that he had put in the apostles' hearts and minds, a big one, a year earlier. When in Capernaum, after the day after he fed the 5,000 with the seven loaves and the few fish, the very next day 
they find him in Capernaum. The same people, and that was interesting for us and important for us to understand. The same people that saw him work that miracle now ask him, if you're the Messiah, what sign are you going to give us? Okay, what miracle are you going to do? And in some sense, we might say that was a silly question because they had just seen him work this, you know, Mac Daddy miracle. He fed lunch to thousands and thousands of people with just a few loaves of bread. But no, in the context of, of their Jewishness and their upbringing, it was perfectly appropriate because they had been taught that when the Messiah comes, he'll be a greater prophet even than Moses. Moses himself said that back in Deuteronomy, okay? A prophet will come greater than I. And to them that meant that he then, therefore, would have a signature miracle that would be even greater than the signature miracle of Moses, which was the manna in the desert. Okay, so, and the manna in the desert was feeding tens of thousands of people every day for 40 years. So yes, that was a bigger miracle than lunch for 5,000 men, or, you know, a big group, as good as that was. And it was in answer to that question then that he said, I am the bread from heaven, the real bread from heaven. The manna wasn't the real bread. That was just a sign. I'm what it pointed to, the living bread that comes from heaven. And if you eat this bread, you'll live forever. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert. And he says, but they died. If you eat this bread, you'll live forever. And then they said, that sounds good. That probably will do it. Give us that bread. But that's when, he got, that's when it got hard. And we went through that in John chapter 6. The drama of the moment should not be lost on us because he hammered it over to them over and over and over. The bread from heaven is my flesh. You must eat my flesh, drink my blood. And I think it was seven times he said it in seven different ways and just hammered it home that he was talking about something literal and in, and in the human understanding quite incomprehensible and even revolting. Right. The Greek word he was using, not just eat, but gnaw, chew. Right. And they, and they end up saying, most of them, the vast majority of them, who had seen him work this miracle, they said, this is intolerable language. Who can, who can stand this? And most of them walked away that day. It was John 6, 6, 6. I always like to pause after I say that. <laughs> John 6, 6, 6. John chapter 6, verse 66. And in hearing this, they walked away. Those who had been willing to be his disciples and proclaim him, proclaim him King and Messiah walked away on that point. Yes, ma'am. So when everybody walked away, is there a significant thing that there was still just the 12? Well, we don't know if it was just the 12. It doesn't say that specifically. But you sure get the feeling from the reading the context there weren't a whole lot more. Because Jesus is talking to the crowd and it says they walked away. Was that 50%, 90%, 100%? We don't know. Then he turns and looks to the apostles. Where there are 12 apostles, you know, it was a bigger group that was called disciples too. And he says, are you going to walk away too? And that's where Peter, good old Peter, says, and he didn't say, no, we got it, no problem. <laughs> yeah, you know, just tell us when the barbecue is supposed to happen and we're on it. Sorry, Lord. I, but, I mean, what else was he dealing with in his, in his mind, right? Now, his answer is, Lord, we've come to believe that you are the Messiah. You have the words of eternal life. Where else are we going to go? That was his answer. We trust you. We don't understand it. Let there be no mistake. But we trust you. And somehow or another, I guess our understanding will catch up later. That's faith, man. That's faith. It's stepping, remember Peter's the one that stepped out of the boat. He knows he's supposed to sink when he hits that water, right? He doesn't know how it's going to work, but when Jesus said, come to me, he said, well, okay. Same guy, all right? I know he sunk eventually, but he walked on water further than any of us have. <laughs> There's only two people that have ever walked on water. One's Jesus and the other's Peter, at least for a little while. So be careful when you start dissing Peter. <laughs> You get it? Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant. I don't ever say that again. <laughs> Bear Bryant. Roll Tide. All right. Thank you, Frank. Let me stop for a second and think what I was talking about now. <laughs> 
I might I immediately went to an SEC championship game that Georgia <laughs> lost in the last three seconds. Uh, no. All right, so at that day then, which was at the Passover time, if you remember, John was clear to point out to us, and he did it for a reason. It was at Passover time, and they were in Galilee. One year later then, they're at the Last Supper. This is where Jesus takes the wine and the bread, and there's no mention of lamb at, in John's rendition of this Last Supper, the pa which was a Passover meal. Jesus says, takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, he Eucharisted it, just the same language he, he said he did at, there when he fed the 5,000. He, he thanked God, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to them, but this time he says, this is my body. He takes the cup and says, this is my blood. Okay? And I just propose to you that the apostles must have been sitting there having an aha moment. Have you ever had an aha moment? Yes. It's just like the curtains pulled back and you went, was Gomer Pyle say Shazam, right? <laughs> Shazam. So that's how he's going to do it, right? Because it answers all those questions. It, and he tells them to do this now. You do this now. And from this day forward, you do this. And they can think, you know what? And if every time we do this, this becomes the body and blood of Jesus Christ, yes, there'll be enough of him for all people for all time. Billions of people... Having the bread from heaven which leads to eternal life, yes, that beats the manna miracle. The answer to the question. And I said all that because sometimes critics to our understanding of the Eucharist would say, no, it was a symbol. Jesus was talking symbolically. And the communion meal that the apostles did and that some churches do now is just a symbolic um, gesture of our fraternity, right? But in the context of the question that those people asked, what will you do that is a greater miracle than Moses and the man in the desert? That doesn't, that's not enough. That doesn't suffice, right? That's why context is so important. I had an encounter with that this week uh, when I was in a Christian bookstore and there was this man out of Somehow it was brought up that I was Catholic. Of course, I had Mother Do you Teresa. want to know what you're doing in a Christian bookstore? And he said, I went to Catholic church one time. He said, they started talking about eating Jesus. And I said, no, I can't get into that. Well, so there's a verse for him. It's John 6, 6, 6. I said, do you read your Bible? He said, well, yes, ma'am, I read my Bible every day. I said, well, then he, you listen when Jesus tells you, do this in remembrance of me, eat my body. Yeah, but you're not eating his body. This went on for a few minutes. It's just friend. But I stood up to <laughs> In love. In love. Speak the truth in love. You have to refrain from doing it. One, one of my sons says, hitting him with the bazooka of there truth. I, did not do that. The Lord me. <laughs> I spoke truth and just blew his head off. <laughs> I don't think I don't think the Lord's pleased with that kind of. But anyway. All right, so that's more or less where we were there today, that last week. Where the at the Last Supper, Jesus took all of those partial meanings, atonement of sin. Thanksgiving, worship, praise, covenant renewal, all right, that were, that were implicit in all the Old Testament sacrifices, and he made it relevant and fulfilled and perfect in the new covenant meal, which he instituted at the Last Supper, and it is the Eucharist, all right? Now, my goal today is to take it a next step, which is to see what happened after the Last Supper. Okay. What happened after the Last Supper? And then what I would do, I'd like to do next week is talk about what all this means to you and me now today. I'll just leave it at that. We'll start there. After the Last Supper, of course, we have New Testament testimony. Uh, 
Before any of the Gospels were written, Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians. So we'll start there. So this was only a few years later. I should even start before that. Acts was written after this letter to Paul, but Acts is describing what was going on before Paul, okay? Before Paul found the faith. The book of Acts written by Luke says, for instance, in chapter 2, right after Pentecost, which we celebrate today, these remained... All right, so Peter had preached the, the first great sermon at Pentecost. And 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is after the house rocked. Okay, very next line in chapter 3, verse 42. These remained faithful to the teaching of the apostles, to the brotherhood, and to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Okay, we're not using the word mass yet. We're not using the word Eucharist yet. But the breaking of the bread was part and parcel to the way they understood from the very first day the church was born to what they were supposed to do as church. All right? I just wanted to point that out. In, in uh, chapter 20 of Acts, says it slightly differently. Oh. Now, Paul, now Luke is up to where he's, he's covering the, the travels of Paul. And he's speaking of one event. And what I want you to notice in this is that he doesn't set it up. He doesn't explain it. It's just how matter-of-factly he just says this. He says that we went to Troas in chapter 20, verse 6. And on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, we met for the breaking of bread. Paul was due to leave the next day. And he preached a sermon that went on till the middle of the night. <laughs> it says he went on and on and on. And the rest of the story is rather humorous, a young man got bored. He got drowsy. He fell out the window and they thought he'd broken his neck. Paul goes down, brings him back to life, sends him home and he goes up and he finishes preaching all night. <laughs> uh, barely slowed him down. So. But what, what were they doing? They met for the breaking of bread. And the long sermon Paul's given was in the context of the breaking of the bread. And Luke doesn't say, oh, this is what we did, blah, 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 blah. He just, he just states it rather matter-of-factly. They all knew this is what they did. And what Acts tells us, what these early disciples, the Jewish disciples would do, they would go to synagogue on Saturday, and on Sunday, the first day of the week, they would gather in their homes to offer the breaking of the bread. And what became known as the Lord's Supper pretty soon after that, okay? So they didn't do it in the temple. They understood this was not part of the temple worship of the old covenant. This was something new, and they did that in their homes, as all Christians did until about the 4th century when it was made legal to practice in a public building. Tom? Jamie, would you say that um, two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Jesus had set up the exact order of Emmaus. First it was like a convivial chatting, then he taught scripture, it wasn't in the temple, and then he broke the road. Right. So, so the day after the resurrection, you're talking about the two disciples, unnamed disciples, who walk with him on the road to Emmaus, and he's explaining in the scriptures why the Messiah that they thought had been put to death, why, he need, why that had to happen. But it isn't until they sit at table, and it says he blesses the bread, th thanks God for it, breaks it, and gives it to them, that they recognize him as Jesus. It's interesting. They recognize him in the breaking of the bread. That's right, but that happened even before. It wasn't really a liturgy, so to speak, but you're right. Jesus revealing the reality of who he is through the breaking of the bread started happening in the day after the resurrection. Okay? And it's becoming more and more evident. What I'm trying to get forth is that it's, it was the, uh, uh, the practice, the routine. It was the standard, part of the standard worship of this new community. What I'm trying to rail against is the complaint is that the Mass and the Eucharist is an invention of a superstitious church in the Middle Ages. That's what I'm trying to obliterate right here. I think by the time we're done, you're going to see there was never a time 
that the church that was born at Pentecost didn't believe what we believe today. And in fact, for 1,500 years, every Christian believed this. There was a schism in about the year 1000 between the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic, but it wasn't over that. They still believed in what we call the real presence, calling it the Eucharist and all the rest. It wasn't until the 1500s that a late-breaking new idea was introduced that it was simply a symbolic gesture. And, and, but even, to tell you the truth, even Martin Luther believed in the real presence. He had a great falling away from the other reformers over that issue. Calvin and Zwingli and some of the others said, no, 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 it's just symbolic to think something that spiritually important could happen in physical, in, in physical form is, no, you're just, you're just still being contaminated by Catholic thinking. But Martin Luther insisted on it, okay? They split up, condemned them, each other as heretics. <laughs> and, so it, and so it began. But my point is that for 1,500 years, there was no dissension on this point. We're having to go back and learn that. But this wasn't, this wasn't something they got together and debated. <laughs> it, it was the commonly held assumption and truth everywhere that people called themselves Christians gathered. All right, that's what I want to get to. Now let's go to Paul's letter to Corinthians. Just two places. And chapter 10 is the first one I want to hit. 1 Corinthians. Second, first, Paul wrote two letters to the Corinthians, which were his, were his problem children. They're a very charismatic church, and that was great. He didn't condemn them for that. They were way into Pentecost and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and all that. But he said, you're letting that make you too arrogant. You're thinking you're better Christians than other people because these spiritual gifts are manifest in your community maybe more than some other places. He says, he says, I speak in tongues more than all of you, but I'm telling you, so it's not that. What I'm telling you is that you think the gifts of the Holy Spirit are marks of your special holiness. They are given to you as gifts to build up the body of Christ to help you love more. So the first letter is about getting back to the basics, things that are even more important than the charismatic gifts that they experience. His second letter is more about wanting to come to them because they're also a wealthy community and he's raising money to take back to uh, the Holy Land, Jerusalem, where there's a drought, okay? So his first letter is where I'm at today. But you're uh, understanding the context. Uh, let's do chapter 10 first, okay? We'll do a little out of 10 and then a little out of 11. If we just look at verses 16 and 17... He tells them in verse 14, have nothing to do with the worship of false gods. I'm talking to you as sensible people. Weigh up for yourselves what I have to say. Here it is. The blessing cup which we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? And the loaf of bread which we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? And as there is one loaf, so we, although there are many of us, are one single body, for we all share in the one loaf. So yes, does it bring us together in community fellowship? Absolutely. That is one of the results of the... But don't overlook what he just said, what it is. It doesn't leave others out. It, it doesn't leave others out. That was his criticism here, that when you gather together, there's a place for... There's a VIP section and there's a place for right. all this kind of stuff. He says, no, no. When you share the Eucharist, there's a supernatural power here that's supposed to bring you together. Don't fight that. If you do, you're missing one of the essential points. Okay, that's what he was trying to get across. In chapter 11, the tradition, I, now he's reminding them about how this Lord's Supper is supposed to, supposed to happen because they've messed it up. They're doing it wrong. Okay. He says, some of you are drinking too much wine. Some of you are eating too much. Some of you are sitting in VIP sections. That's not the way it's supposed to be. All right? He's telling them the way it is supposed to be. The tradition I received from the Lord, and this is by direct revelation too, remember. This is how Paul says he, he got his stuff. His, I spent time in the school of Jesus where he supernaturally revealed things to me. All right? The tradition I received from the Lord and handed on to you is that, and he's calling it the Lord's Supper. He did that back in verse 20. Because oh, 
I hate to keep doing it. So when you meet together, doing it like you do, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, he says. Because he says, because you're doing it wrong, all those things I mentioned. Now he's telling them how to do it right. The tradition I received from the Lord, and hand it on to you, is that on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread. After he had given thanks, he broke it. This should sound very familiar to you. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, with the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this as a memorial of me. Whenever you eat this bread then and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily is answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Just let that sink in before I go any further. Not answering for being disrespectful to a sacred icon or to a religious symbol. It's not like desecrating a statue or a crucifix. He says, you are answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Okay. Everyone, therefore, is to examine himself and only then eat of the bread or drink from the cup because a person who eats and drinks without recognizing the body is eating and drinking his own condemnation. And he goes on with this very ominous statement, that is why many of you are weak and ill and a good number have died. So Paul takes it pretty seriously. And I'd say it's a lot more than just being disrespectful and rude. He is saying this is something, a much more serious crime with a much more serious consequence. So if you have a complaint that Catholics take this too seriously, I would say, well, before you start fussing at me, you need to have an argument with Paul. And when you work it out with Paul, then you can come and tell me how you answer this. Why would Paul be so serious? You know? Of course we handle the consecrated bread and blood with great reference. Of course we look to make sure that every speck is cleaned up. We don't sling it around. We don't treat it like it's a medium that just can be disposed of because it only has symbolic value. If we drop a host, it's, it's a big deal. We, are, we do try to take some care on who receives. Do people come up and receive who don't believe? Yes, but you can only do what you can do. So, yes, we wait until children are at least able to have a rudimentary understanding of what they're doing before we... So they can recognize, at least in, a, in a, a level that's proper for their age, of what they're doing, for instance. And, and, and non-Catholics come and say, I want to receive the communion. And say, but out of charity, we don't just distribute it that way. It's not that we don't like you. But if Paul's right here, and you don't believe what we believe here, and we're right, and we give you communion, and you receive it, I could be doing something very uncharitable to you. Right? Wait, say that again? <laughs> <laughs> let's, just, let's just suppose the scripture is true. Let's just suppose that Paul is right. And so when you have a friend comes to Mass who doesn't believe in the real presence as we do, but who wants to take communion because when they go to X church, it's for everyone. And you, you say, but no, you have to be Catholic to receive here. A lot of times that's perceived as being very inhospitable. Well, you're not very nice. Because if I go to the X church, I can receive communion. They recognize me as a nice person and a Christian and all that kind of stuff. And you say, that's not it. If Paul's right here, and you receive without recognizing, believing what we believe here, it can do you harm. That's one of the reasons we reserve it. It's not, it is an act of charity. Do you understand? If Paul's right, and I give you communion because I'm afraid that you might get your feelings hurt or be mad at me, and I give it to you, and Paul's right, and it somehow does you harm because you've received unworthily, that's on me, I think. If you knowingly, if you knew this. Knowingly, yes, of course. 
But it's not just for non-Catholics. Catholics that have not received the sacrament of First Communion. Catholics that are in a state of mortal sin should not receive. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a whole, it's proper reception is part and parcel of what Paul says we should be about. Not just doing it and then treating it like junk food or drive through Happy Meal. This is, this is at the center of perfect worship. At the center of perfect worship. Like being at the Last Supper where Jesus took this and, and irrevocably melded it with his sacrifice on the cross. And we went through that last week, did we not? When he says, it is finished, that last supper was finished when he breathed his last breath and bled his last drop of blood. That's what we're about. And, the, and at long last, the perfect sacrifice for sin and thanksgiving has been come to earth and made available to us. We're not supposed to treat it like it's nothing. Nance? Missy? Um, when we were in Fatima with 710,000 other people, <laughs> and I went up to the priest to receive and worked my way through the crowd and held my hands out, he shook his head at me. And I held my hands out further, and he shook his head again. I then leaned forward and opened my mouth, and he gave me communion. And it was such an unusual feeling to me uh, because I realized at that moment what I just take for granted every other Sunday when I hold out my hand. This is a special, this is a special moment. There's a meaning here. And there, I'm not going there's to a do practical that. reason they did that, Missy, if I didn't explain that. I, I, it's because you have a lot of tourists that show up for this big event too. And they want to be sure that the consecrated hosts that are given out are consumed. This is not a souvenir. No. Take home, you know, this is my weekend in Fatima. It's, it's right. a it was a well, it is a habit. It's a very well, originally that's exactly the way it was received. When we went back to receiving it in the hand, that was not a new idea. That is a restoration of the original practice that existed for a long time. In, and it is perfectly proper for you to receive it in your hand. It wasn't that he didn't know that. And it wasn't trying to be a throwback to a day gone by. In Fatima and places like that, because I asked this question, they're trying to be careful that no one disrespects it. Because if you, receive, if you take it in your mouth, you've at least swallowed it. He knows it's not going to go in your pocket. This is not going to live on your mantle, or it's not going to be pressed into your souvenir book. Understand? Yeah. Or, God forbid, it's not going to be taken off to a Wiccan coven and, des and desecrated. This is the way, this is one of the practical ways they can try to protect the dignity of the sacrament in a crowd, and it was 200,000. But, but it, it, but it oh, 200,000? 200,000. It wasn't 750. That's impressive, but 200,000. Sorry, You know, and so what are you going to, what are you going to do, right? So um, they can't even ask, are you Catholic, because there's so many languages there. So, so all they do is they want to put it in your mouth. That's why they did that there. But it does go to the heart of kind of what we're saying. The church has a responsibility to protect the dignity. Don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but there's something, a greater issue here. Well, that was kind of, like I said, it was a wake up for me because every Sunday, you know, pretty soon it's road and it's routine. But then I, when this happened, I thought, this is really special. This is really special. And I need to remember that every time I receive it. Yeah. That was, we that was good. Good, Nancy, and then okay. one more. Um, I was just going to say, in the words that our Lord used when he said, do this in memorial of me, do this in remembrance of me. Right. When that happens on the altar, and the words of consecration are spoken, we are present at the foot of the right. cross. We are present in the upper room when, when the Lord suffer, because the words actually made to make present. Right. To make present. I, th I think maybe we mentioned that last week. Uh, there's a poverty in that the English word represent to us means is not adequate. It, it's re-present, to make present again. It's a Greek word called anamnesis, which is very clear in the Greek and the English. English is actually not nearly as good as the Greek, but I don't speak it. So, I mean, anamnesis is the word, and it means to make present again. It's the same language that the Jews use at the Passover, that somehow or another 
We're not just remembering like Memorial Day. We're not just remembering an important event. We're present at it. Now that's something that's a little out of bounds for our natural thinking. It's another thing that we can only know by faith. But if you dare to know it by faith and accept that, it's a miracle. And the miracle aspect of the Eucharist is what I'm really trying to get down to. Belief in miracles is waning. That's the reason why belief in the real presence is waning. We're much more comfortable with the psychological or the symbolic meaning of the Eucharist. Because when we start believing in things like uh, things that are beyond our natural capacity, it makes us very uncomfortable as scientific, rational, 21st century Americans, right? But that's what we're challenged to do. Just as Jesus challenged and would not relent at, those, at the people in Capernaum. He said, no, this is what it is. And I'm not going to downpedal it or make it more palatable just so that you can receive it on your terms. I want you to receive it on my terms. And if it makes you uncomfortable for a while, so be it. Grow into it. Let your understanding, your human understanding, catch up with your faith understanding maybe one day. But even if it never does, you can know this by faith. Can you tell them about the Santorin miracle that we got to see today? The what? Yeah, the Santorin Eucharistic miracle. Yeah, that one. Um, maybe. You push them into a fourth session almost. That oh, was another question. Who was it? Was it Jesus? No. Oh, oh, yeah. I was going to say that in many countries, uh, people are not allowed to touch the, uh, the bread. You know? uh, that's why they put it in the mouth. It, yeah. You know? It is the custom in a lot of places, but it is, it is a valid custom to receive in your hand. The, and it's, and, uh, oh. the irony is that a lot of people who object to receiving it in hand say, no, I want to receive it in my mouth the original way. The irony is that it wasn't the original way. The original way, as we, I don't know if I brought that document or not, in, in the Didache, the, when they're training catechumens, it says, when that day comes you receive communion, make a throne for, your, for the Lord. Put your left hand on top of your right. And, and, this, and, and, and receive him as your king. That's the, that was the language. So when the Second Vatican Council said, it's okay, not necessarily preferred, but it's okay to receive in the hand, this wasn't some newfangled idea of liberation theology. This was a going back to original thinking. The same way we know people get up crazy, all those char crazy charismatics, they pray like this instead of like this. Yeah. Well, let me clue you in. The way the apostles prayed, the way pre Jesus prayed was like this. All right? It was like this. You know? They hadn't even invented deodorant yet. And they, did, they prayed like this, right? I don't know when this came in as being more pious, uh, but it's not the original. It's not the original. And I'm not endorsing one or the other. I'm just saying the irony of some of the complaints by traditionalists uh, is, is that they're actually holding on to newer ideas. So, uh, uh, Doctor, yes? Well, talking about uh, traditional ideas, uh, in, some, in some societies, uh, it is felt offensive if you just use your left hand. Yeah. To, yeah. I, I don't know whether that's the case in, uh, in the Middle East. I know that where, where we come from, <laughs> it's offensive when you are receiving something, you keep this hand and you take this from. It's, 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 yeah, in, our, in our culture, it's, it's said to be disrespectful. Yes. And I, I, sometimes I tell my students this this thing you do here, you want to receive your paper, you, you use your left hand. If you do it in your workplace, your boss is trying to give you something you use the left hand, you may not work there the next day. Well, in this country, I see that. That tradition, of course, is not part of American culture. We wouldn't understand that, but it is recognized. And the reason that you do this and receive it in the left hand is so when you pick Christ up and put him in your mouth, it's with your right hand. Just a small rubric. When the deacon hands, you know, the deacon makes the cup and he hands it to the priest, he needs to be with his right hand. Mm. And that goes back, you know, if you do it the left hand, I mean, it doesn't invalidate the mass, but the rubric says with the right hand. There's nuances of, of these things that all have meaning. Every gesture, every color, every smell, every sound, every word has meaning in the Eucharist. And it's deep-rooted in our history. And it goes back, and what I hope to get to today 
it doesn't go back to the Middle Ages. It goes back to the first century, right? Pentecost, when Jesus ascended to the Tom? hand of the Father. Jay, just to put on the light side, the hands folded thing was an invention by the nuns in the Catholic school. Boys, putting their hands up would be smacking the Yeah, okay. Roll tide. I'm going to make you sit over here with Frank. <laughs> Keep you out of <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's right. I don't. I don't know. Somebody do a paper on folded hands, okay, for me. I don't. I don't know. It's probably pretty interesting, and it might be funny. It might be funny. There are funny aspects to it, you know. Okay, I'm going to digress. In the mass, you know, we we ring the bells at the moment of consecration, and we didn't do that for a long time. It's not an essential part of the rubric. Some people liked it because. When they were a kid, that happened, and it sort of reminds them of the sacred. The reason that happened is because PA systems are new. <laughs> For many, 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 many centuries, big churches, you're in the back, you couldn't hear. So to let everybody know the moment of consecration, they used bells. Stained glass windows, people were illiterate. They didn't have Bibles, and if they did, they couldn't read them. The gospel stories were painted in pictures and put on Put in the windows. You come into the church and you get your catechesis, you know, by looking around. Architecture was all supposed to speak to the soaring gl glory of God. It wasn't idolatry. It was to teach the gospel message. It was to teach. It was to, it was to uh, represent that you're in sacred time and sacred space when you walk in here. The little um, pattern, you know, the little plate. Father, Father Ray doesn't use it. It's not essential. But a lot of priests put, and whenever they're not using the cup, they put, they put the thing on top. Flies! <laughs> of course, open air cathedrals. I mean, you've got a cup of wine there. Somebody said, we need to have something to put on top. It just became part of the standard armamentarium. If you don't have one, is a mass valid? <laughs> Absolutely. It's not super superstitious. It was very practical. And that's the, reason it's, that's the reason it was there. Okay, let's get back to real business here. I think this is interesting. Well. Things I haven't thought about. So this is, this is still in the New Testament, okay? I haven't gone to patristics yet, which I'm going to in a moment, which is writings of the very early church about how to do church. And in some cases written by people who received their instruction from the apostles themselves. Some of these writings were written before the apostles were even all dead. That's how far back this goes. Now, it is impossible for us to do an exhaustive look at patristics, even on just this topic. <laughs> Volumes and volumes and volumes of such written materials are available. And they're not hidden in Vatican archives. Go to the library, okay? Google it, all right? There's a three-volume work called Jurgens, uh, Faith of the Fathers. And it's three volumes. Three volumes are just the, by the earliest period, the middle, and then later. And I think the latest one only goes up to year 800 or so. And it's in its collections, and, but it, you, can, you can look in the index and you can look, look up what? Mary, Pope, Eucharist, whatever you want to do, and it'll send you to these. And they're just snippets. They're not entire things. It's just snippets. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a little time reading snippets. I could read snippets for an hour and you'd get bored. But I want to do, do a few. Okay? Are you with me? Clement of Alexandria, this is 202, and the, I think my uh, purpose in these first few is just to show you that the word Eucharist came in very early, because we didn't see that in the New Testament. We didn't see that in Acts. The breaking of bread and the Lord's Supper, okay, is with the terms. But this is in 202, Clement of Alexandria says, the mixture of the water and of the wine is called Eucharist. To drink of the blood of Jesus is to become a partaker of the Lord's immortality. They who by faith partake of it are sanctified, both in body 
and soul. 202. And you'll say, well, that's okay, but let's do Irenaeus, 185 AD. He says, The Eucharist confirms our opinion, for we offer to him those things which are his, declaring in a fit manner the gift and the acceptance of flesh and spirit. For as the bread of the earth, receiving the invitation of God is no longer common bread, but the Eucharist, consisting of two elements, earthly and heavenly. So also our bodies, when they receive the Eucharist, are no longer corruptible, but have the hope of resurrection into eternity. Justin Martyr, 165, I'm getting earlier on you. He cites Malachi 1.1. When God speaking of the Gentiles who would become believers in the New Covenant era, and he says, that's namely us, who in every place offer sacrifices to him, which is the bread of the Eucharist and the cup of the Eucharist. 106, I'm getting earlier now. Ignatius of Antioch, who knew the apostles, who was a disciple of John. He wrote of one common Eucharist, for there is but one body of our Lord Jesus Christ, and but one cup with his blood, and one single altar of sacrifice. Clement of Rome, you know this guy, he's actually mentioned in Acts. In the one Eucharistic prayer, Lioness, Cletus, Clement, this is him, all right? He's the third pope after Peter. You say, well, that must be a long time. No, no, no. When you became pope, you had about a two-year lifespan before they found you, right? <laughs> the church is underground, all right? So John is still alive, actually, here. John is still alive. This is 96 AD. He's the, he's the bishop of Rome, the fourth pope. And he writes, I, Clement of Rome, a fellow worker with the apostles. He knew him. He worked with Paul. He worked with Peter in Rome. He knew John. He relates the new priesthood with that of the Levites, the old priesthood. And he says, in the same way, my brothers, when we offer our Eucharist to God, each one should keep to his own degree. In other words, there are priests and there are lay people. That's what he's trying to say. Let me give you this one. This is, this is from uh, what's called the Didache. Which is where, Jaber? The Didache. 60 A.D. 60 A.D. Paul's still alive. Peter's still alive. A few of the apostles have already been martyred. This is before most of the books of the New Testament have even been written. They're still in oral form. The Didache was used to train converts. Okay? This, and it's a very interesting to read. Very interesting to read. But anyway, Article 9, he says, In regard to the Eucharist, you shall give thanks thus. First, in regard to the cup, and say, We give you thanks, our Father, for the holy vine of David your son, which you have made known to us through Jesus your son. Glory be to you forever. In regard to the broken bread, we give you thanks, our Father, for the life and knowledge which you have made known to us through Jesus your Son. Glory be to you forever. As this broken bread was scattered on the mountains, but brought together, was made one, so together your church from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory and the power through Jesus Christ forever. Let no one eat or drink of the Eucharist with you except those who have been baptized in the name of the Lord. Catechumens went through a two-year process before they were baptized. They weren't even allowed, if they came to Mass, they had to leave after the, reading, the readings. They were not allowed to stay when the liturgy of the, the Eucharist began. It was considered so sacred and holy. That brought some problems for the early church because they were known as the secret society. And there were rumors that when they got together, they were drinking blood. And they were cannibals, right? This is why they were an easy group politically to persecute. Everybody was against that, right? Let's go get Nero. I didn't burn Rome. Must have been those cannibals. Round them up, right? It's exactly what he did. All right, so this is, 
This was used as a primer to teach the catechism to converts in Rome, which is where Nero was. And this was written just a year or two before Nero burned Rome. Okay? A little bit longer, maybe five years. Didache. How about this one? I don't want to give you more than you want to hear. This is another one from Ignatius of Antioch. This is as he's being led away to be uh, eaten by lions. Ignatius of Antioch, who was a disciple both of Peter and John, he says in one of his letters, I learned at the feet of John. All right? Now he's an old man, and he's been arrested because he's a bishop of Antioch, which was an important early church, being led away, and he knows he's going to be fed to the lions. And he's writing letters to the churches that were in his diocese, okay? This is part of his letter to the Antioch. He says, I know I have no more taste for corruptible food, nor the pleasures of this life. I desire only the bread of God, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, who was the seed of David. And for drink, I desire his blood, which is love incorruptible. 110 AD. My point so much for the accusation that the Catholic doctrine of the, Europe, of the real presence was a superstitious invest, in, in, uh, invention of the Middle Ages. These men are talking real presence. And we're talking about the first Years, the first generation of the church. And so it continues. I don't want to go too much. I want to give you one more because it's time to quit. This is back again with Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr was a very well-respected philosopher, thinker of his age. And he became a believer. Okay? Well, he thought it was important that the Roman authorities, who he was much friends with, he knew important people, understood what actually went on in this secret mass that there was no need to fear, that all the stuff he had been told was, was garbage and he wanted them to understand. So in this letter, he writes at the, uh, in the second century, very early in the second century, he writes to a friend of his in the high position, uh, the pagan emperor Antoninus Pius, around the year 155. This is what he says. On the day we call the day of the sun. Sunday. Sunday. He's writing to the Romans, right? Okay, the Sunday. All who dwell in the city or the country gather in the same place. First, the memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets are read. There was no Bible yet. They had the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, right? And they had the writings, some of the writings of the Gospel and of the New Testament, which would be the New Testament. But it wouldn't be put together by the church into what we know as the Bible for a couple of hundred years. But he says, we read the memoirs of the apostles... And the writings of the prophets, as much as time permits. When the reader has finished, he who presides, either the bishop or the priest who represents him, over those gathers, admonishes and challenges them to imitate these things. That's the homily. Then we all rise together and we offer prayers for ourselves and for all others, wherever they may be, so that we may be found righteous by our life and actions and faithful to the commandments, so as to obtain eternal life. It's the prayers of the faithful. When the prayers are concluded, we exchange the kiss of peace. (laughs) We've watered that down so you can shake hands if you want. (laughs) A sign of peace. Then someone brings bread and a cup of water and wine mixed together to him who presides over the brethren. He takes them and offers praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And for a considerable time, He gives thanks, he eucharists them, giving thanks to God that we have been judged worthy of these gifts. It's the Eucharistic prayer. When he has concluded the prayers and thanksgiving, all present standing in voice with great acclamation by saying, Amen, Amen, Amen. One of the ancient Roman historians who was not a Christian said, We knew when the Christians were gathered for Mass because when they said the Amen, it was so loud you could hear it all over the neighborhood. All right, the great Amen. When he who presides has given thanks and the people have responded, those whom we call deacons give to those present the Eucharistic bread, wine, and water and then take them to those who are absent. I just read for you the Mass as you will celebrate it today. Today. The elements are all there. Are all there. 
This is not a pope in the Middle Ages. This is Justin Martyr in 155 AD telling you what the Christians had been doing for a long time. He's not inventing it even this day. This is what they do and have been doing whenever they gather. My point, when we gather together to offer the Mass, has there been organic development of the liturgy? Of course. Is it in English instead of Greek? Of course. Have we added some finery to the church? Of course. But is the essential organic elements of what we do any different from what the early church, and I'm talking about the first generation who learned it from the apostles, from what they believed and what they did? The answer is no. And there was no, there was no opposition to this belief for 1,500 years. Never accept that what we do here is a new, a new, uh, an invention of superstitious people who, who got simple over the years. It is what the people of faith have done from the very beginning because they and we dare to believe Jesus was right. Amen. In the name of Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord, it's so hard, but it is true. It is good. In faith alone we can know this, and I ask you through faith to plant it deep in our hearts that we might love you deeper, serve you better, and witness to your truth as lovingly and as powerfully as we can. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Thanks for coming.